Hi guys, in this video we will study about the ear, mainly the external and middle ear. As you know, the ear is a very important organ for hearing as well as it also helps in the equilibrium of the body, the erect posture of the body. So uh, to begin with, the ear is divided into three parts, the external ear, the middle ear as well as the internal ear. In this lecture, we will study about the external and middle ear and the internal ear itself is a separate lecture. So we will study it separately. So here you can see here this is called as the, the auricle or the pinna as well as the this is the external acoustic meatus. This together form the external ear. Then we have the middle ear here and this is the internal ear. First, we'll begin with the external ear. So, the external ear is a very important structure for the collection as well as the conduction of the sound waves. The structure of the ear, external ear itself, uh, is very feasible for the conduction as well as the collection of the, the sound waves which are traveling in the air. Okay, and they will be transmitted to the tympanic membrane. Here is the tympanic membrane, this is the tympanic membrane and this whole thing here from here to here, this whole thing is the external ear and so the air will be collected whichever uh, waves hit the ear to the auricle or the pinna and they are transmitted through this tube to the, the tympanic membrane. And uh, <clears throat> the audible frequency, as you know, it will be 20 to 20,000 uh, decibel units. So those waves which we can hear will be transmitted through the, uh, the external ear. Uh, 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 talking about the development in brief, uh, the external ear developed from the, uh, the ectodermal first brachial cleft. If you uh, remember the pharyngeal arches, here are the pharyngeal pouches, the first, second, third, fourth and the sixth and between the pouches there will be the clefts. This is between the first and second pharyngeal pouch will be the pharyngeal cleft. So this first pharyngeal uh, cleft will or the brachial cleft will be giving rise to the, the, uh, the external ear. Okay. Uh, the pinna of the external ear is mostly a mammalian feature. It is uh, more commonly seen in the uh, mammalian uh, 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 animals. The external ear consists of the auricle as I said, auricle as well as the external acoustic meatus. So this is the, the auricle or it is also called as the pinna and it has some uh, uh, features here. Here this is the the external acoustic piatus deep inside which is a tube okay so just around the tube we can see this part is called as the tragus and just opposite uh, so that there is an elevation similar to that of the tragus that is called as the anti tragus okay and below this you can see a soft uh, uh, tissue uh, with the fat content and covered by the skin this is called as the lobule and if you go above, this is uh, made up of the, uh, the elastic tissue and uh, here you can see here, this is called as the, uh, this is the helix and this is called as the anti-helix. This is the helix and this is called as the anti-helix. And in between, there is a small space here, this is called as the scuffled fossa. And on the helix, there is a small elevation, this is called as the Darwin's tubercle. And if you come in the front, this is called as the triangular fossa. And here there is a conca called as the kumba conca. And this is the conca here. This is the kumba conca. So these are some of the important features of the external ear. We will not go into details about this. So this is called as the, the, uh, the auricle or the pinna. Then deep inside we have the external acoustic meatus that is a tube like structure. So if you uh, have seen the auricle or the pinna it is trumpet like 
and uh, it will be collecting the uh, sound vibrations or the sound waves it is covered by skin as you know and inside you can see the elastic cartilage yellow elastic cartilage so that's why it will be flexible whenever to and turn it will come back to recoils back to its normal position and shape however this elastic cartilage is absent in the lower part that is the the lobule you have seen the lobule so this is called as the lobule here there is no elastic cartilage uh, but it is filled with a lot of fat okay fibro fatty tissue so that's why it will become soft uh, uh, in nature and this whole thing uh, auricle uh, is covered by the the skin okay uh, there are some muscles of the uh, in the auricle itself but they are vestigial in case of human beings uh, but uh, in case of lower animals uh, they are functional and they help in the twisting and turning of the uh, uh, external ear or the auricle depending on the from where the sounds are coming if you see observe some of the lower animals uh, they can twist and turn their uh, auricle okay because of this muscles but in case of human beings they are vestigial so the muscles are divided into two types extrinsic as well as the intrinsic extrinsic are those muscles which are outside the the auricle itself but they twist and turn the auricle and there are some muscles which are within this auricle okay the extrinsic muscles will be the auricularis anterior superior as well as the posterior if you see if you have studied the muscles uh, of the face as well as the head and neck there you can see the auricularis <coughs> anterior superior as well as the posterior the nerve supply of the auricularis anterior and superior is by the temporal branch of the facial nerve so this is the temporal branch of the facial nerve and the uh, the uh, the nerve supply of the uh, auricularis posterior will be by the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve so this is the nerve supply of these three muscles and the action it moves the auricle in case of lower animals but in case of the human beings as i said uh, even if it is present if you imagine that the, it is present then it will be insignificant okay coming to the intrinsic muscles the intrinsic muscles will be helices major as well as the minor then we have the tragicus then we have the antitragicus then transversus auriculae then as well as the the last one called as the obliquus auriculae the action of these muscles again they uh, modify the shape of the auricle okay but still again it is insignificant in case of the human beings and the nerve supply is by the facial nerve coming to the blood supply of this pinna or the auricle uh the it is supplied by the posterior auricular as well as the superficial temporal arteries the superficial temporal arteries and its branches as well as the uh, the posterior auricular artery the lymphatic drainage is into the pre auricular as well as the post auricular group of lymph nodes pre auricle there are few group of lymph nodes here uh, in front of the uh, the uh, pinna that will be called as the pre auricular then there are few group of lymph nodes behind the ear those are called as the post auricular group of lymph nodes and and these uh, pre auricular and post auricular finally drain into the superficial cervical group of lymph nodes the development coming to the development of the auricle itself the auricle develops from fusion of six mesodermal hillocks or tubercles around the external opening of the first uh, brachial or the uh, pharyngeal cleft as i showed you the first brachial cleft between the two pouches so there there will be small hillocks or developed mesoderma hillocks or tubercles and they all join together to form the external uh, uh, or the the pinna or the auricle okay uh, this will be dealt in detail when we talk about the development of the ear itself coming to the nerve supply nerve supply is by the auriculo temporal branch of the mandibular nerve so this yellowish region will be supplied by the auriculo temporal branch of the mandibular nerve then the posterior part of the pinna will be supplied by the lesser occipital nerve and the lowermost part will be supplied by the 
the greater auricular nerve. So these three nerves will be supplying the uh, the pinna, auricular temporal branch of the mandibular nerve, the lesser occipital nerve as well as the greater auricular nerve. Now going to the external acoustic meatus that is the tunnel, the older tube which is present. It extends from the bottom of the concha. So you have seen the concha will be here. So this is the concha and from the bottom of the concha will be the beginning of the external acoustic meatus and it runs up to the tympanic membrane. Okay, and the length, total length of this uh, tube external acoustic meatus will be almost 2.4 centimeters or 24 millimeters. It is not straight as you have seen in the pictures, uh, but it is uh, slightly curved. Okay, even though here it has been shown as though it is a straight tube for the simplification of understanding, they have shown it as a, a straight tube, but it is not as straight as shown here. It is it is a shape. Okay, uh, so uh, and it has three parts the pass external, pass intermedia as well as the pass interna. Pass externa will be directed upwards, forwards as well as medially. Pass intermedia, so it is divided into uh, external one third, middle one third and uh, the inner one third. So the middle one third that is the pass intermedia will be directed upwards, backwards and medially and pass interna will be directed downwards, forwards and medially. This can be appreciated when you put uh, a torch to examine the uh, the uh, the tympanic membrane itself uh, you cannot see directly into the tympanic membrane because as you know as i said it is a shaped curve okay so to for visualization of this uh, the uh, the tympanic membrane to see the tympanic membrane so what should you do when you cannot see it directly by putting the torch but then you have to pull the the uh, the ear upwards backwards as well as laterally ear mean the pinna if you pull the pinna upwards backwards as well as laterally to make the tube straight okay the external caustic meter straight then you can see into the uh, the um, the tympanic membrane so this uh, clearly indicates that it is not straight tube but it is a shield okay coming to the subdivisions uh, partly it is cartilaginous as well as partly it is uh, bony. So the lateral part, lateral one third, that is the pass externa, will be cartilaginous uh, in continuation with the ex, uh, the pinna uh, and the um, uh, medial two thirds. Okay, that is the pass intermedia as well as the pass interna will be uh, uh, bony. Okay. And the pony part is comparatively narrower compared to the, the cartilage part. This is important because if there are any foreign bodies, it will be stuck uh, in between the, the cartilaginous as well as the pony part if they are quite large of that size. So this is again uh, to show the external caustic matters beginning from the, the concha, the base of the con concha is here and up to the tympanic membrane. Okay, so this is the whole external acoustic matters and it is bony part, this is the bony part where we have uh, the cartilaginous part which is the lateral one third and the medial two thirds will be the bony part. Okay. <coughs> the canal uh, of this or uh, the opening or uh, the tube itself is not round but it is oval in section and there are constrictions because of the, as I said, uh, the bony and the uh, um, the cartilage part. So there are two constrictions. One constriction at the junction of the bony and the cartilage part. That is the lateral one third and medial two thirds, where the uh, cartilage part end and the bony part begins. So there there is a constriction, and the second constriction is uh, said to be the most narrowest part. That is called as the isthmus. Wherever there is narrowing, then there is that part is called as isthmus. So here in the uh, external acoustic meatus also there is an isthmus. Uh, it is almost two centimeters, uh, centimeters deep to the concha. The total length, as I said, is 2.4 centimeters. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, isthmus almost uh, of a distance of two centimeters from the concha. Okay. 
the lining of this hole of this uh, uh, external cord stigmatus uh, will be by the skin uh, that is uh, uh, just the normal skin uh, just like that of the which is covering the ear but uh, the uh, it is totally adherent to the bones and the cartilage as you know it is made up of cartilage or the bone okay lateral one third is cartilage inner uh, two thirds will be bony and the skin is totally directly adherent to this uh, bone or the cartilage part this is important because uh, whenever there are any infections okay uh, even slight infection will lead to uh, accumulation if there is any pus or uh, swelling or the inflammation then it leads to severe pain okay even slight infection because the skin is totally adherent and to the bone or the cartilage and there is no space for for the accumulation of pus or for the even the accumulation of the uh, the uh, the uh, the fluid because of the inflammation so this leads to severe pain hence it is very painful and they are modified coiled sweat glands uh, within the this cartilage part and these are uh, said to be ceremonious glands and they secrete ear wax or the sermon okay these are the the foreign bodies okay so this wax will be automatically removed coming to the blood supply the blood supply of the outer part is supplied by the superficial temporal artery as well as the posterior ocular artery which are supplying the the pinna itself so these are uh, uh, as well as the inner part by the maxillary artery so the external part will be supplying uh, supplied by the same artery which are supplying the the pinna that is the superficial temporal arteries as well as the posterior auricular artery and the inner part will be supplied by the the maxillary artery coming to the lymphatic drainage uh, it will be to the pre and post auricular as well as the cervical group of lymph nodes okay just like that of the the uh, the pinna uh, Mm, uh, the external acoustic meatus develops as a funnel shaped ectodermal invagination from the dorsal part of the first brachial cleft so this is the the otic placard and from there will be a development of the 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 pinna itself as well as uh, the uh, the external acoustic meatus coming to the applied aspects as i said before because the skin is totally adherent to the 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 pinna as well as to the external acoustic meatus any inflammation or any infection of the external meatus as well as the even the pinna causes uh, uh, the swelling will be very small because there is no space at all so the swelling will be small but the the pain or uh, dollar from these uh, infections and inflammation will be severe and i said Uh, the reason the second thing important uh, applied aspects uh, of this uh, the pinna uh, as well as the the external acoustic meatus is the toothache uh, especially if there is toothache from the lower jaw as well as the cancer of the tongue it will be
ear as well as even the the pain dull from because of the cancer of the tongue okay the third important uh, applied aspect is the ear wax okay uh, this ear wax usually collects and it comes out, uh, comes out automatically itself you don't have to remove it uh, but sometimes it get accumulated and accumulated and it uh, doesn't come out at that time uh, the doctor will uh, try to flush it out okay during flushing uh, uh, flushing out of this uh, uh, ear wax sometimes it can uh, reflexively produce persistent cough or vomiting. The presence of ear wax itself can uh, produce cough uh, as well as vomiting. So, in case of especially in case of children, if there is pers uh, persistent cough and vomiting, the doctor will examine his ear. Okay, uh, to check whether there is accumulation of wax. And as I said, this can be easily removed if it is. The anatomy of tympanic membrane or tympanic membrane is also called as eardrum in layman's language. Tympanic membrane is a very important membrane which separates the external ear from the middle ear. So it is an oval, thin, semi-transparent, pearly gray, trilaminar membrane. Trilaminar because it has three layers. So that's why it is called as trilaminar membrane which separates the tympanic cavity that is the cavity of the middle ear from the external acoustic meatus that is the external ear to be very simple uh, the tympanic membrane separates the external ear from the middle ear the diameter at the maximum summit is almost 9 to 10 millimeters and the minimum is 8 to 9 millimeters the position uh, it is not vertically placed or horizontally placed but it is placed obliquely at an acute angle of 55 degree with the floor and it is facing downwards forwards as well as laterally okay in case of children uh, the tympanic membrane is much more horizontal compared to the adults and the advantage is they can withstand even loud noisy sound uh, the uh, the second thing is because of this angulation of 55 degree the anterior wall and the floor in case of adult are much more longer compared to the posterior wall and the uh, roof the subdivisions uh, the there is something called as the malar fold which divides the tympanic membrane into two parts we'll see. so if you see here this is the malar fold so this is the posterior malar fold and here is the anterior malar fold okay so this is the anterior malar fold this is the posterior malar fold this divides the whole of the tympanic membrane into a top part this is called as the pars flaccida and this part so sorry this part will be called as the past tensa this whole part remaining part uh, is called as past tensa this past flaccida and tensa is because the past flaccida is like as you can see here it is lax and loose and past tensa it is tense it is tight so that's why depending on their uh, intensity they have been called as past flaccida and tensa Pass flaccida as you can see it is small triangular as well as lax okay in this picture you can see it is small uh, as well as triangular and lax but pass tensa is taught by the handle of the malleus and radiating fibers if you can see here so this is much more tense because of, because of the this is the handle of the malleus okay which will be pulling and this will make tense this whole part of the uh, uh, tympanic membrane that's what is called as the pass tensa and they are uh, as we have mentioned uh, there are radiating fibers if you can see here these are the radiating fibers okay which will make it uh, much more tenser coming to the surface of the membrane uh, as i said it is trilaminar in nature it has an outer and inner surfaces and there is uh, in between there is a layer okay uh, the inner surface is concave convex sorry the inner surface is convex and gives attachment to the handle of the malleus what you are seeing here is the the uh, the seen from outside and here you can see it from inside i will show you the picture where it is shown okay so here you can see here this is the uh, the pictures shown from inside and here you can see the uh, the uh, the malleus itself as well as the handle of the malleus 
this is the incus and stapes so here you can see this uh, uh, fibers which are uh, radiating here towards the handle okay the inner surface is convex if you can see here so this is the inner surface it is convex okay as well as uh, 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 the convex and gives attachment to the handle of the malleus as you can see it gives attachment to the uh, handle of the malleus itself okay uh, which extends up to its center yeah so it will this handle will not go down or it, it is not short but it is up to the middle of this uh, tympanic membrane it comes up up, uh, up to the the center of this uh, tympanic membrane uh, with maximum convexity called uh, umbo so the lowermost part will be uh, curved and that will be called as the uh, umbo so here you can see uh, this part is called as the the umbo this is the handle of the malleus this is also seen from in the, from the uh, 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 the handle can be seen and here this part the most bent part this will be called as the the umbo okay so the surface it has an outer and inner surface the inner surface is convex gives attachment to the handle of the malleus which extends up to its center with maximum convexity called as umbo okay the structure of the membrane as uh, again uh, as i repeated before uh, it is trilaminar so it has three layers the outer cuticular layer the intermediate fibrous layer and the innermost mucosal layer so the outer layer will be called as cuticular because it is uh, the skin which is covering the uh, uh, the the outer layer of the tympanic membrane but it is hairless but it is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium the lining epithelium over the the outer layer of the tympanic membrane will be keratinized stratified squamous epithelium but it is hairless okay as you know the keratinized uh, they will be hairless okay the second layer will be the intermediate fibrous layer in between we have the fibrous layer uh, it will be having uh, radiations as we have already seen the outer radiating as well as inner circular fibers will be there in past fascida it is replaced by loose connective tissue that's why there is no fibrous layer in the past flaccida as you have seen the top flaccida means the upper part okay here uh, in this picture is not very clear uh, in this yeah here you can see this the past flaccida it is lax and loose because there is no fibrous layer but it is uh, just the uh, the uh, connective tissue layer which is present there so that's why it will be uh, much more loose and lax but where there is fibrous layer that will be tense okay in the uh, past tensor okay uh, coming to the innermost layer which is uh, towards the the middle layer uh, that will be the inner mucosal layer because it will be covered by mucous membrane lined by simple ciliated or columnar uh, or sometimes even the squamous epithelium okay it is simple ciliated columnar or sometimes even the squamous epithelium that is the mucosal inner layer so there are three layers of the uh, tympanic membrane outer cuticular layer intermediate fibrous layer and the innermost or the inner layer that is called as the mucosal layer coming to small spaces which are around this tympanic membrane there are three recesses or spaces this is called an anterior recess posterior recess as well as the uh, porous uh, recess so this these three layers of recesses are there recesses mean small spaces which are present around the tympanic membrane okay and this cannot be seen with the, these pictures but they are present okay coming to the the uh, the blood supply or the arterial supply it is by the deep auricular branch of the maxillary artery which supplies the the outer layer that is the cuticular layer uh, the stylomastoid branch of the posterior auricular as well as the anterior tympanic branch of the maxillary artery supply the mucosal layer and the fibrous layer as you know it doesn't need blood supply uh, uh, it's a directly okay so the there are two bl uh, uh, blood supplies the outer layer for the outer and inner layer the outer layer will be supplied by deep auricular branch of the maxillary artery 
and the uh, mucosal layer will be supplied by the stylomyostom branch of the posterior auricular as well as the anterior tympanic branch of the maxillary arteries okay coming to the venous drainage it is uh, uh, to a plexus uh, which uh, will be finally drained into the pterygoid venous plexus through the external jugular vein as well as the inner uh, layer into the transverse sinus and pterygoid venous plexus okay okay so uh, the partlet will be draining outside and partly drains into the uh, the uh, the uh, cavity of the skull itself okay so the transverse sinus as well as the pterygoid venous uh, uh, sinus and plexus will be deep inside the the cavity of the skull okay uh, and the outer layer will be drained into the external jugular vein okay coming to the nerve supply the cuticular layer will be supplied by the auricular temporal branch okay upper and anterior part and uh, the auricular branch of the vagus to the lower and posterior part so auricular temporal nerve will be supplying the upper and anterior part of the tympanic membrane the cuticular layer outside okay and the auricular branch of the vagus uh, vagus nerve will be supplying the lower and the posterior part and the mucosal part will be supplied by the glossopharyngeal uh, nerve through its tympanic plexus so here you can see here this is the the tympanic nerve and this is the tympanic plexus okay so this tympanic nerve is coming from the the glossopharyngeal nerve and which will be supplying the the mucosal layer so it forms a plexus called as the tympanic plexus and that will supply the mucosal layer but from outside it will be the auricular temporal nerve as well as the auricular branch of the vagus okay coming to the development uh, the tympanic membrane develops from all the three embryonucleus as you uh, we saw it has three layers so all these three layers develop from three different uh, embryonucleus the cuticular layer will be developing from the ectoderm uh, the intermediate fibrous part will be developing from the mesoderm and the inner mucosal layer will be developing from the endoderm so all the three ecto hmm, the ectoderm mesoderm as well as the endoderm come in contact at the in the tympanic membrane the cuticular layer from the ectoderm of the dorsal end of the first brachial cleft the intermediate from the uh, intermediate layer that is the fibrous layer from the mesoderm of the adjoining brachial arteries uh, sorry brachial arches sorry uh, mesoderm of the adjoining brachial arches and the inner mucosal layer from the endoderm of the tubo tympanic recess so all these three are form uh, the tympanic membrane here this is the uh, uh, otic pit uh, which is forming uh, the the external acoustic matters and here will be the development of the tympanic membrane okay coming to the applied anatomy meringotomy okay this is the procedure done whenever uh, uh, the uh, the tympanic membrane has to be uh, uh, has to be cut uh, to drain uh, any kind of fluid which is within the middle ear if there is any uh, pus or infection uh, the like the otitis media uh, then uh, uh, then you have to put a cut on this tympanic membrane that is called as the meringotomy okay but meringotomy when you are doing it you should be very careful and it is usually done on the posterior inferior part of the uh, the tympanic membrane the posterior as well as inferior part why to avoid injury to the corda tympanic nerve which is passing behind the pass flaccida and the ossicles near here so here will be the flaccida and here will be the corda tympanic nerve which will be passing so to avoid injury to this corda tympanic nerve the surgery is done usually in the posterior inferior part lower part okay uh, here you can see here so this is the the facial nerve running all the way and beside that a nerve coming from the facial nerve this is called as the corda tympanic nerve and uh, here it is much more clear so here you can see this is the corda tympanic nerve running all the way here above will be the pass flaccida and this is the pass tensor and in between this is running and between the the ossicles so this is called as the, the corda tympanic nerve so if you do any such as above then it might lead to injury to this corda tympanic 
Uh, so the surgeries are usually done in the posterior and inferior part. Okay. So this is about the myrogotony. Then the second thing is when you are examining the uh, the tympanic membrane, as I said. Uh, uh, the ear has to be pulled upwards, backwards as well as laterally and if you put a torch, it will give a cone of light. When light falls on the tympanic membrane, the concavity of the membrane produces a cone of light. So if you can see here, there is a cone of light over the anterior inferior quadrant. So this is usually, this part will be flash with the light, not the whole part, but this part will be flash with a light, this is called as the cone of light. Okay, because of the, the convexity itself, you can see a flash of light. This will be called as the, the cone of light, okay, in this region. Coming to middle ear, middle ear is also called as tympanic cavity or sometimes it is also mentioned as tympanum. So middle ear is same as that of the tympanic cavity. They, sometimes they can mention it as tympanic cavity or tympanum also. Uh, the middle ear uh, is a bony cavity within the petrous temporal bone. Uh, it is one of the bones of the skull. In the petrous part of the temporal bone, uh, we can uh, uh, locate the middle ear. And it is lined, if you see uh, the cavity of the middle ear, it is lined by mucous membrane and it is filled with air which is derived from the nasopharynx through the auditory tube. So the middle ear is not a totally a closed uh, cavity but it is communicating with the nasopharynx through the auditory tube also called as the eustachian tube okay so the middle ear directly communicates with that of the nasopharynx so it is this cavity is present within the uh, petrous part of the temporal bone and it is lined by mucous membrane and it is filled with cavity and the air is coming from the nasopharynx okay it intensifies the force of sound vibration without altering the amplitude 15 to 20 times more than that of the tympanic membrane okay so this has the capacity to intensify the force of the sound vibrations without altering the amplitude that is important and it increases almost 15 to 20 times more than that of the tympanic membrane and this uh, vibrations which are generated here are transmitted uh, from the tympanic membrane to the the fenestrad vestibuli that is the the round window okay uh, into the uh, uh, by the movement of the ossicles of the ear in the middle ear we will see that there are ossicles uh, which will uh, transmit the uh, the vibration all the same so it will be communicating through this tube into the the nasopharynx uh, as uh, I said before, it is filled with air and lined by mucous membrane and this uh, uh, middle ear assumes the adult size by birth. So already uh, by birth, it will be already the size of an adult and its vertical and anteroposterior diameter are about 15 millimeters. Okay, so it, uh, it is uh, uh, approximately like a uh, uh, cube but not exactly, uh, but the vertical, the highest uh, diameters in the vertical as well as anti-posterior diameters will be 15 millimeters. And as I said, the communication in the front with the lateral wall of the nasopharynx via the auditory tube. So it will be communicating to the station tube uh, or the auditory tube uh, uh, with the nasopharynx in the front. And behind in the posterior wall, it will be communicating uh, uh, with the mastoid antrum, okay, uh, through the auditus to the antrum. We will see the mastoid antrum itself 
uh, it is present within the master process okay uh, so that will uh, we'll see later so this area or the the middle ear is sandwiched between the external and the internal ear uh, external is outside and internal is inside so in between this area that is the middle ear is sandwich and on coronal section it resembles even though i said it the uh, the anteroposterior and the vertical diameters are almost 50 millimeters uh, it should look like a, a cuboid box but it is actually in the middle it is compressed so it looks like a biconcave disc just like that of the the shape of the rbc okay it is uh, 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 very uh, narrow compared to the the lower and upper part so it looks like as though it is biconcave just like that of the shape of the rbc as i said because it is compressed at the center and enlarged at the peripheries because of the the uh, the shape of the uh, the tympanic membrane itself uh, in the external ear and the the internal ear from the uh, inside so this is the shape of the tympanic membrane so you can see here it is invaginating bulging inside okay <clears throat> can, coming to the contents what exactly we see within the tympanic uh, cavity uh, or the middle ear so in the middle ear it is lined by mucous membrane and consists of three ossicles three small bones these are called as ossicles so here you can see here these are the three ossicles and we see two muscles and six sets of blood vessels and four sets of nerves okay the three ossicles as you know is the malleus incus as well as the stapes so these are the three bones here so this is the the malleus this is the incus and this is the shape of the the stapes okay these are the three small bones which will be present which are called as ossicles will be present in the middle ear along with that there are two muscles these are the tensor tympani as well as the trapezius. these are the two muscles which will be present here see here three ossicles and there are six sets of blood vessels just double and two muscles and four sets of nerves okay we'll talk about this blood vessels and uh, nerves later when we talk about the blood supply and uh, supply okay so these are three ossicles and two muscles Okay, three ossicles are malleus, incus, and stapes, and two muscles, tensor tympani, as well as the strapedius. Along with that, there are ligaments of ear ossicles. They are very small uh, ligaments, uh, so that the two bones are uh, 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 connected to each other, but we will not go into details about these ligaments. We will try to keep uh, it as simple as possible. Uh, coming to the malleus, this is the malleus. So this is the head of the malleus. This is the neck of the malleus, and it has two processes: anterior process as well as the lateral process. And we have already seen the handle of the malleus, which goes up to the middle of the the tympanic membrane, which is in contact with the tympanic membrane, and which will be uh, connected. The the umbo part, the bent part, will be almost at the center of the tympanic membrane. Okay. So this is the handle of the malleus. This is the lateral process, this is the anterior process, this is the neck of the malleus and this is the head. And this malleus will be articulating with that of the, the uh, incus. Okay, so the incus will articulate here. This is the incus here, incus bone. Okay, this will be articulating here. This is called as the incus articulation where the incus will be articulating. Here this is called as the malleus articulation. Okay, so this is where the malleus and incus will articulate. Okay, this uh, incus has a body, this is the, called as the body of the incus and two limbs, short limb as well as the long limb. This is the short limb which is horizontal limb and the long limb will be vertical. Then this is the stapes, so this is the head of the stapes and it has two limbs, this also has two limbs, anterior limb and the posterior limb and it has a base. Okay, so this is the base of the stapes. Coming to the subdivisions of the middle ear, middle ear is divided into three parts, the epitympanum, 
the mesotympanum as well as the hypotympanum. As the name itself indicates, uh, epi means above, okay, uh, epi tympanum. So it is above the tympanum. This is called as the, also called as the attic. Okay, above the tympanic membrane consists of the head of the malleus and the body as well as the short process of the incus. If you see here, so this is, if you see, this is the middle ear, the whole thing. So the part which is above the, the tympanum, so the tympanic membrane, this is the tympanic membrane, which is above the tympanic membrane, this part is called as the epitympanum. This is called as the mesotympanum, which is behind the tympanic membrane. And below, this is called as the hypotympanum. Okay, so this is the uh, epitympanum, also called as the attic. So where we can see the head of the malleus, the head of the malleus as the body as well as the short process of the incus. So here you can see the head of the malleus, the body as well as the, the short process of the incus. Body and the body of the uh, incus as well as the short process. Okay, then. In the mesotympanum, which is just opposite to the tympanic membrane, that is this part. So here, this is called as the, the mesotympanum, where we can see the this is the narrowest part. As I said, it is because at the middle part it will, will be very narrow. So which contains the handle of the malleus, the long process, and the of the incus and stapes. So here you can see this is the handle of the malleus, the long process of the the incus, and both the uh, limbs of the the steps all these are present in the uh, mesotympanum and in the hypotympanum which is below the membrane this will be communicating here with the nasopharynx this is called as the the pharyngotympanic tube or it is also called as the uh, the eustachian tube or it, or it is also called as the auditory tube so all the three are same so when they mention tubotympanic uh, tube it is nothing but the the uh, station tube or the auditory tube so this is the middle ear this whole thing is the middle ear epitympanum mesotympanum and the hypotympanum below coming to the boundaries of the tympanic cavity so as i said it looks almost like a, a cuboidal uh, uh, box uh, even though it is not exactly cuboidal because at the center as we said it is compressed but still if we imagine it as it as a uh, the box or uh, cuboidal box it will be presenting with six walls the roof the floor anterior wall posterior wall medial as well as the, the lateral wall so this is how it looks like this is the picture uh, taken from the student's grace and this has depicted the things very uh, elegantly here okay so here this is the their roof so starting with the roof, roof is uh, made up of the uh, tegment tympanum. Mm. So if you see here, this the tegment tympanum. So this roof is much more wider compared to the floor. Okay. So even though we said it is like a cuboidal box, but not exactly because the roof is larger compared to the floor. Floor is narrower, much more narrower. Okay. And you can trace here the lesser and greater petrosal. A nurse which will be piercing the roof it has not been shown here but you can imagine that they will be piercing the lesser and greater petrosal nurse will be piercing this roof coming to the floor floor is formed by the jugular fossa okay if you see here here you can see the, this is the internal jugular vein so uh, the presence of internal jugular vein will lead to the formation of a fossa on the uh, uh, floor that will be called as the the jugular fossa the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve appears of the floor and enters the tympanic cavity if you see here so this is the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve which will be piercing the floor and enters the, the tympanic cavity that is the middle ear coming to the anterior wall the upper canal for the tensor tympanic muscle the lower canal for the uh, uh, for the bony part of the auditory tube so if you see here above here this is one of the uh, the two muscles we are talking about so i said there are two muscles here within the the cavity of the uh, middle ear so one is the tensor tympani the second muscle is the stapedius so this is the stapedius here the uh, pyramidal eminence of the stapedius this is the tensor tympani muscle so this tympani uh, uh, this is the anterior wall here so this uh, above we can see trace the tensor tympani muscle okay so the upper canal for the tensor tympani so there is a canal here through which this muscle is passing so this is the upper canal which is for the tensor tympani and the lower canal here this is the larger one this is the for the 
pharyngo tympanic tube or the astrician tube or auditory tube which communicates with the uh, the uh, nasopharynx so this is the communication of the nasopharynx with that of the middle ear then um, okay then coming to the posterior wall so the lowermost part by the bony carotid canal okay so it's that one so this is the the internal carotid artery so this internal carotid presence of internal carotid artery leads to formation of uh, the bony uh, canal for the carotid artery so that will be uh, present here okay so because of the presence of this internal carotid artery there will be canal here near the lower part of the anterior wall coming to the posterior wall posterior wall will be uh, to the auditus to the mastoid diaphragm i said there will be communication anteriorly it will be communicating with the tuber tympanic process into the nasopharynx posterior to the mastoid process through the auditus this is the opening auditus means opening to the mastoid antrum we will see that mastoid antrum as well as the uh, mastoid process okay so posteriorly it is communicating here through the auditus to the mastoid antrum okay the posterior wall will be having the auditus to the mastoid antrum the fossa okay fossa incidus canal of the facial nerve and hollow pyramidal eminence so here you can see here so this is the prominence of the lateral semicircular canal then we have the the uh, the uh, the canal for the uh, facial nerve this is called as the facial canal and the pyramidal eminence of the stapedius muscle so all this will be present here okay coming to the medial wall then you can see the there is promontory oval window round window oblique facial canal so here you can see here so this is the promontory so this is the uh, invagination here into the uh, middle ear this is the promontory and here you can trace the oval window above and the round window below and also you can see the the process of the facial canal passing through this wall also okay then coming to the lateral wall lateral wall is that wall where we are tracing uh, all the structures so this here it is not shown here um, because we wanted to see inside so the lateral wall it is mucus covered medial surface of the tympanic membrane so uh, so it will be uh, wall will be totally closed and it will be uh, covered by mucus membrane and uh, the medial surface of the uh, uh, tympanic membrane will be there okay here coming to the arterial supply arterial supply the blood supply of this middle ear is by the anterior tympanic branch of the maxillary artery as well as the posterior tympanic branch of the posterior auricular artery coming to the venous drainage it will be draining into the superior petrosal sinus as well as the pterygoid venous plexus which are both in the the uh, the cranial cavity itself okay petrosal sinus as well as the pterygoid plexus of veins coming to the nerve supply it is supplied by the tympanic plexus formed by the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve as well as superior and inferior uh, coracoidal tympanic nerves arising from the tympanic plexus around the internal uh, carotid artery if you have seen this uh, in this picture if you can see here this is the internal this is the external carotid artery here will be the internal carotid artery and here also if you can see this is the internal carotid artery and there is plexus of nerves around this okay so all this plexus will join together to form the the glossopharyngeal nerve here tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve and the plexus around the uh, uh, the intercarotid artery all join together to form the the uh, tympanic plexus tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve as well as the superior and inferior uh, carotid tympanic nerves arising from the sympathetic plexus you saw the sympathetic plexus around the intercarotid artery all this will form the the uh, the tympanic plexus which will supply the middle ear coming to the applied aspects as i said uh, the middle ear is not a closed cavity but it is communicating uh, uh, anteriorly with that of the the uh, nasopharynx so if there is any infections uh, in the nasopharynx or the throat infections easily spread to the middle ear Uh, through the auditory tube or the stretion tube and that leads to uh, otitis media okay so and if it is not uh, treated early then it leads to the uh, chronic otitis media okay so uh, the infections can easily pass from the uh, oral cavity 
or the uh, the throat infections or the uh, nasopharyngeal infections easily transmitted get transmitted to the middle ear and leads to otitis media uh, sometimes fractures of the middle cranial fossa middle cranial fossa there are three uh, fossas in the cranial cavity anterior middle as well as posterior cranial fossa so if there is fracture of the middle cranial fossa that leads to breaking of the roof of the medial middle ear rupture of the tympanic membrane and causes bleeding through the ear sometimes you see bleeding through the ear along with sometimes even the csf will be coming out okay this is because of the the fracture in the middle cranial fossa and rupture in the tympanic membrane which leads to bleeding from the ear as well as uh, draining of the CSF. Coming to the, as I was talking about the uh, mastoid antrum or the tympanic uh, uh, cavity, it is so it is a small circular aid filled sp space situated in the posterior part of the petrostemporal bone. Okay, I'll show you this picture. Okay, so this is the, the mastoid process. Okay. Okay, this is the mastoid process within the mastoid process. So here you can see that this is the middle ear. This is the uh, pharyngotympanic tube which is communicating with the nasopharynx from the anterior wall. The posterior wall it is communicating uh, through the auditus to the mastoid antrum into the mastoid antrum itself. This is the mastoid antrum and there are small spaces here within this uh, uh, mastoid process. These are called as the mastoid AS cells which are communicating with each other and so this is important. So this is small circular and air filled space situated in the posterior part of the petros uh, temporal bone. Okay, mastoid process with which is present in the, the temporal bone, the petrous part of the temporal bone. And it is of the, as I said before, it is already the adult size at birth, just like that of the middle ear, even the mastoid antrum will be uh, of the size of an adult by birth. And the, it is the size of it is very small. Even though it is adult size, it will be of almost a small pea like just one centimeter in diameter and a capacity and has a capacity of about one milliliter. That's all. But it is important. Okay, now we'll talk about how it is important. Uh, as we saw, there are mastoid air cells within this mastoid process. There are mastoid air cells. They are series of intercommunicating spaces of variable size present within the mastoid process they vary in number we cannot uh, exactly uh, number them because they keep on varying from person to person so these are series of intercommunicating spaces these are small spaces mastoid cells are uh, small spaces which are communicating with each other and they don't have exact size they are variable in size present within the mastoid process Okay, coming to the applied aspect, what is the importance? Mastoiditis is secondary to chronic uh, otitis media. Okay, so if there is any infection of the middle ear, we said the infection from the uh, nasopharynx can easily get transmitted to the middle ear. And if this is not treated early, uh, the infections in the middle ear, which is called as the otitis media. So if it becomes chronic otitis media, then it might lead to uh, transmission of this, this infection into the mastoid process itself okay to these mastoid air cells as well as mastoid antrum, antrum and that uh, that condition is called as the mastoiditis mastoiditis and the treatment is mastoidectomy okay even if they, that infection cannot be treated with antibiotics well with high antibiotics then we have to cut and remove that mastoid process that is called as the mastoidectomy Okay, so this is of the, uh, the importance of the mastoid air cells as well as the mastoid antrum. Then auditory tube, you already see the auditory tube or the uh, pharyngotympanic tube or the station tube. So here this is the, uh, the pharyngotympanic tube or auditory tube which is communicating with the nasopharynx into the middle ear. So any infections here might easily get transmitted to the middle ear. So this is all about the, the middle ear. So these are the references. If you have any questions, you can pose to me and I will try to answer. Thank you very much. Hi friends, if you like my video and if you want to see similar kind of videos in the future, subscribe to my channel as well as like the video, press the bell icon so that you can get regular updates and you will be the first to get the updates. Then you can also comment as well as share this video with all your friends so that all can benefit from this. Thank you very much.